so hi for our audience at inside.com thanks for joining us for this interview today we have the great pleasure of speaking with zach hudson zach is all the founder of deft which is the way i would describe the company as an e-commerce search engine tool that helps right. shoppers buy things more easily is that a correct assessment zach kind of that's a great that's a great assessment i don't even awesome. need to, to add anything obviously e-commerce is a huge industry I can, and i can't wait for zach to tell us more about the company his past endeavors and his experience and all the stories that he's gathered, all, of, all the lessons that he knows so far from his career. I know that he's worked in business and in tech for quite a few years. So without further ado, Zach, again, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. My guess, I want to first start the conversation in the, with the origin story, maybe, of how you got into tech, how you fell in love with the industry. Did you mm -hmm. always want to join the industry? Was it sort of random? How it happened? Yeah, my... Unfortunately, I don't have some sort of, you know, crazy origin story here. It's, it's a very long and winding road, but I started my career in finance. I did not enjoy it. Taught myself to program, landed a job in the e-commerce industry, and I've been working in e-commerce in technology ever since. And so that was back in 2012, 2013, somewhere around there. And uh, yeah, and then I started my first company in 17, I want to say. And I moved out to San Francisco and yeah, I've been building my own thing ever since. Awesome. And did you have any previous ideas about businesses or was it necessarily maybe not even your biggest plan to start a business? How did that come about? Yeah. So the, the product I was building before I met, so the, the origin story for Deft, and we can get into that, starts more with my co-founder, Alex, than it does with me. I was building this other company. It was called Recommend. It was kind of like Yelp, but for product reviews. Mm -hmm. And and I bumped in Alex at a startup event back in 2019. And that's how we started working together on Deft. He was already building the early days of of what we what we have now. So that was the other idea. I think the problem of trust and authenticity in e-commerce has been a problem that I've been fascinated with and been trying to fix for a very long time, both as a somebody who's been on both sides of, of the aisle. I've yeah. I worked for agencies and e-commerce companies, so I've seen kind of what the problems that they're dealing with. And then as a consumer, I see the, the troubles I deal with as a shopper. So yeah, that's, that's, that was the other idea before this one. And this is a very big project, so I don't really have much space in my brain to, for, to do, think about anything else. And was there anything that you basically transferred in terms of lesson-wise or experience-wise from your experience in working for larger companies in your startup? I know that you worked at Vanguard, so obviously at the beginning, yeah. so obviously coming from that environment and then progressing in your career and then joining sure. a startup, creating a startup, how does that translate? I, I don't think, I think I learned a lot of things not to do from mm -hmm. Vanguard. Nothing, nothing, nothing that would really make our startup perform better. There is such a big company. There's a lot of, of bureau bureaucracy there. It's, it's, a, it's a, it's a totally different different world when you get to thousands of, of, of employees. The next company they worked for was, I was higher number 20 or maybe even less than that. And so I learned a lot of really great lessons from that. And I've worked for relatively small companies from anywhere between like higher number 12 and 20, and then would grow with a company into about 150. And that's, that's where I've spent the majority of my career. And I want to get maybe more on the product side for depth. I think the idea is, it sounds so simple, but the effect that it could have, it could have on the user experience, I think is profound because oftentimes in e-commerce, I think we find ourselves looking for something and it sounds simple. It sounds like you're just going to search for it and find it immediately, mm -hmm. but then you find out the experience is very, could be very, very complicated. So I think Deft's place could play a great role in making this user experience easier. So I want to get more maybe on the product side for you to describe us exactly how does the product work? user feedback how has that been so far what guys or what features maybe you guys have changed from user feedback of course and and a really interesting statistic to to bring up there to talk about what what you're saying about how this could simplify the journey the the average shopper today spends 15 hours across 12 different websites over the course of two and a half months trying to decide on a purchase and the number is actually increasing not decreasing so there's wow. definitely a problem with uh, shopping online and discovery in general. And that's, that's the problem that we're trying to tackle. And that's why my co-founder, Alex, tried to build a business in the first place. He was looking for a gray couch with wood trim on the bottom in a mid-century style. And it took him something like 30 hours to find it. And being the crazy engineer that he is, he just went and started building his own, his own natural language search engine to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And I think what's really interesting in this world today is with, with AI coming up is that 
it's these AI tools are generating so much content. It makes people, it makes it for people to discern fact from fiction online. And so it's, it's kind of compounding the problem. And then also you have companies like Google and Amazon that continue to push the most relevant listings down for more advertising dollars. So searches for simple things like sectional come up with all sorts of irrelevant things because marketers have learned how to game these keyword based search engines. So the problem is getting worse. It's getting more fuzzy, but let's dive into uh, what we've learned from, from users. So what specifically do you want to know? Um, everything. I mean, maybe even things that you build out in the beginning that you thought were your strong points, and then maybe users change your mind on that, or maybe some thoughts that you basically guys, they confirmed those guesses for you, anything that you, that you think would be valuable for founders watching the interview really. Cool. So yeah, we, before building too much of a search engine, because it is such a big project, we wanted to understand exactly how people were going to use the product. So the very first version of Deft was, was just a survey box. And when you filled it out, it would actually go to me and Alex, and we would, we would do the results manually via email. And that helped us get a really good sense of the types of queries people were going to submit. Another interesting statistic is that Google sees like 1% of unique, 1% of their searches are unique every day. Like they've never seen a query like that mm -hmm. before. And we experience very similar things. People are searching for all sorts of interesting things and in unique ways that you would never guess. So that taught us a lot about how we needed to build our product. How do we needed to build our parser? How do we need to build our, our language models to understand what users are going to query for? I think that's, that's kind of the main learning was just trying to understand the beauty of building search, a search engine is that people tell you what they're looking for. Like they yeah. literally are typing it into the box. So you have this amazing insight into the, into the user's mind. And if you can just deliver on that, if you can give them what they're asking for, they're more likely to purchase and you're going to make them happy. So it's, it's kind of, it's my favorite feedback loop because other products, you're just trying to guess what the user's mm -hmm. getting out. You kind of like see some clicks, but in, with a search box, they're telling you what they're looking for, which is super fascinating. And obviously e-commerce is huge, 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 especially like you said, growing, but as user interest around the world grows, I'm guessing so does the number of companies trying to solve these problems. So I, I think there's a lot of people who are, who are always trying to solve this problem. It, it's just that search is incredibly difficult. And what's search, surprisingly, the search algorithm is not the most complicated thing. I actually think the, the most complicated thing here is the amount of data that you have to process and clean up. E-commerce data is incredibly messy. Go look at a title of a product on Amazon. It's like a paragraph long. It's called a slipcover couch sofa sectional. You know, they try to put every single keyword into the title and cleaning up that data is what makes a, a really accurate search like what Def can do possible. So that's the biggest challenge is cleaning up that data. And it's not an easy pr problem to solve. It, it takes a lot of compute. I mean, it just takes a lot of hours of cleaning up. And for me, from the outside, I think... I would ask the obvious question, which I'm guessing a lot of people who are not in this niche would ask, how about Google, Amazon, other major sure. players in the game in terms of competition? Are they necessarily your competition directly, indirectly? Uh, definitely. I mean, I think the over 50% of searches, e-commerce searches start on Google and Amazon. I actually think more of them skew towards Amazon than Google, which is surprising, just given Google's dominance in the, in the search space. But I think there's a couple of differences between depth, depth and those search engines that we can get into. And I think there's a couple of things that also make it difficult for them to copy what we're solving. So I think the, the most obvious and simple one is that we don't rely on advertising and we can't be manipulated by SEO. We go back to the original paper from Sergey and Larry from Google. They wrote that ads provide great short-term revenue, but over time they lead to worse results for the customer. And while they may not have taken that to heart, we certainly have. Deft is building, we're built around providing the best results for customers, and it's not a marketing channel for brands to sell you stuff. And I think the, the second major thing is how our search engine works. So we talked a little bit about data. Let's talk about like how the technology is built too. We understand, or Deft understands significantly more about each listing that we process. It's far beyond keywords or meta descriptions. So as a user, this means you don't have to limit yourself to you don't have to have to limit yourself when you're searching with us. You can find exactly what you're looking for. So uh, you can use natural language, images, or both. We're completely multimodal. So for instance, you can upload a picture on Deft of a coffee table and you can say like this, but in blue, or you can s try to ask it to keep it within a particular budget. And being able to find something uh, that you're looking for that accurately is, is mind blowing. And I guess the, the final thing that I'll mention here is that we kind of enable a new type of discovery, which is... Fantastic, not only for the shoppers, but for brands too. So 
as a former e-commerce director for a few brands, I know firsthand how hard it is to get your name out there. And especially if you don't have the budget to dominate paid search, or if you don't want to give 35% of your sale to Amazon, there's so many incredible brands that are out there that go undiscovered. It's search is pay to play. So we enable brands to do what they do best, which is creating great, great products. And we provide users with the fast, intelligent way to reach mm -hmm. them. So those are, those are kind of the three main differences that I see. I'd be happy to talk about why I think it would be hard for Google and Amazon to, to be, to do exactly what we're doing. I'm, they definitely are thinking about this. And there's a lot of new players in the space. I think a lot of people are just kind of slapping LLMs onto their search and calling it uh, something new. Yeah. But you can't, you can't get radically better search with just an intuitive layer on top of bad data. It's garbage in, garbage out in the e-commerce world. So uh, you have to do something different, which we have. So I think basically you could say that the technology needs to be built from the ground up the proper way. You can't just slap a new technology without having the basis of it be built for that. Yeah, yeah, you can't just, yeah, it's just garbage in, garbage out with e-commerce data and just the web at large. It's been over, so over SEO'd and over advertised for so long, it makes it really difficult to do. You get kind of subpar results. And we've built, the way that we handle that is we've built a knowledge graph that we pair with LLMs and it allows us to do these amazing type of searches. And I'm happy to get into how that, how that works. Yeah, please do. I would be very curious, especially now with the, all the recent developments in AI and obviously the buzz is all around AI right now in the industry. And AI plays a huge role in your specific company because of the features and the recommendations it provides. So please, yeah, you could definitely elaborate more on that. So we unite knowledge graphs and large language models together. And I, I guess the best analogy I found for this is, is kind of like the human mind. And I'm going to oversimplify this dramatically for the sake of the analogy. But you have, with your brain, you have a logical side and you have an intuitive side. LLMs like with power chat GPT are kind of the intuitive side of the brain, but you don't unlock the full power of the model until you give it a logical side to rely on. And so that's what we've invented at death. It's almost 700, 700 times faster than some of the state of the art databases out there for these types of queries. So by giving that logical side, we're able to kind of inform the LLM to do some of the searches that you see on death. And was that even though the company wasn't founded too long ago? But even then, AI wasn't as big of a buzzword as it is right now in the last, as it has been in the last 18 months, I'd say. So like you said, your other co-founder was a major part of the engineering side. So I'm guessing AI was basically thought of as a key ingredient to the recipe from the beginning, I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of people slept on AI until maybe like GPT 3.5, mm -hmm. like 3, 3.5 really started to kick it up, but it's, it's been around for a moment and it's been able to do some really incredible things. It still has hallucinations and you kind of have to feed it the right information to be able to get the right output out of it. And so that's, that's kind of where our idea originally came from is, is we're going to unite like the logic, the two halves of the brain together to create this amazing search. So we started building, building the knowledge graph, LLMs. Llama, GBT, all of these that are coming out, they're rapidly developing, provide the other half of the brain. So we just use both of those. And to get more on the business side, in terms of monetizing, as you mentioned, ads have been definitely a controversial topic for users for a long time. On one side, it seems that companies think of them as a necessity. And mm -hmm. on the other side, users complain a lot. And we've definitely seen a lot of complaints with search engines and stuff recently. So I, I'm curious in terms of monetizing the product, what is your guys' plan for that? Do you have a long-term solution to combat, quote-unquote, the ads? Yep. We've tested out subscriptions and we've had some success with it. We also make affiliate revenue on every sale. We don't. The reason we don't rely on affiliate revenue is because we don't want our poll. We might mm -hmm. start putting certain, certain listings up if they make, make us more money. So that's why we don't rely on affiliate revenue. So we kind of think of our... We think of our, our subscriptions a little bit like if Superhuman had a free tier. Have you ever used Superhuman yeah. before? Yeah. Email tool. It's once you've had a taste of this truly optimized search experience, it's really hard to go back to anything else, which is what Def provides. So for our paid users, we're allowing search customization and also a shopping assistant that we're releasing soon. And those two tools are, are incredible. And it's really hard to go back to normal shopping once you've had a taste of them. Yeah, absolutely. It feels like having an AI assistant for your shopping, but more than that, maybe a step beyond because the accuracy at which you could describe what you're looking for is really amazing. So that be potentially really a game changer for the entire um, user experience. 
on the investor side, I know that right now a lot of startups have been complaining in the past few months, maybe the past year and a half. I know that you guys have raised funds in the past. What do you think about fundraising in this space? Have you felt that investors, considering the fact that you're this startup in this major industry with a lot of these giants, mm -hmm. do they feel like you need a lot of capital in order to, what has been your experience on that side? That's a really good question. I haven't I kept my, my pulse to the market quite that much. And we've just been heads down building our product and focusing on what, what users are asking for. I, I'm curious to know, I think if you are going out and trying to build your own LLM model, I think that the capital that you need is, is high. You have to get all the data, clean it, tag it, you know, do all the things that you need to do to be able to fit it to the model and then, you know, watch the outputs. It takes a ton of, ton of horsepower to do that. We are at the point where we're processing so many products a day that it's, it is a little bit capital intensive, but nowhere near what and it would take to create an entirely new LLM. So I think in, in terms of why investors are interested in DEFT, obviously the market size is huge. E-commerce is an uh, e-commerce search alone is an over $500 billion market. There's some people who are also interested in how we've united the knowledge graphs with mm -hmm. LLMs. That's, that's a completely novel approach that I think people who are in that space value. But I think the, the universal characteristic of why people are in and why people get interested in what we're building at Deft is that everybody shops online today. And almost everyone that we've spoken with has had a frustrating shopping experience. So the reason they invest in us is because they've had this problem themselves and they just want it solved. So I think that's, that's what most people relate to. But again, I haven't tested my finger to the market, so I don't, I don't necessarily know what the capital requirements are or what kind of investors are thinking about this space right now. It's, it's like the... It's obviously been a more bear market for, for founders to go out and fundraise, but the AI hype cycle is also driving companies that are developing that space. Maybe it balances out. So we'll see. And I'm curious to ask you this, another, other question about user experience, e-commerce, especially the AI, AI side of it sounds very technical and it is, it is very technical. So obviously the engineering part has like a crucial role, but I'm also curious, how have you guys tackled the human side of the process of mm. buying stuff. So on one side, you have this incredibly complex technical issue of finding the right technology that helps recommend the best products, find them, but also what challenges have you guys had in terms of predicting user behavior, finding out how people shop? Have you guys sort of delved into that world and maybe what are lessons have you learned? Definitely. And I, I've worked in the space for so long now, I'm, I'm pretty in tune with a lot of the problems that cause people to either abandon their cart or not finish their purchase. What, so what, what have we learned? Well, first of all, we're, we're not focused on the buying side. We are a search engine, so we will take you to the, the place where you can make the purchase and then you will yeah, buy it through whatever yeah. platform that they're on. And the reason we do that is we don't want to be seen as a parasite for a lot of these brands. We want to be kind of a helpful partner for them and also for the consumer. We wouldn't want them to have us remove their listings from our search engine because we're like taking away their their ability to understand their customer better. Checkout is still definitely a pain point. I think it's gotten a lot better over over the years with the introduction of Shopify and then also uh, Amazon and Prime delivery being a, one of the major factors there. So I, I we're just we haven't uh, delved into that side. And for us, it's really just focus on finding the right product. And then next up is trying to bring in more research about the product. So. After you find it, you kind of want to validate that it is still the right one. So for us, we're based on the query that somebody is typing in, we're trying to pull in more information. So our vision is that when you type in a pet friendly sectional for under $5,000, that we're bringing in reviews from other, we're bringing in like wire cutter posts, YouTube videos, et cetera, so that you can make your decision more quickly. Besides that, I want to maybe get more into the team. Yeah. So obviously the first question would be how many members does the team have? What's, mm -hmm. what's your stance on? scaling necessarily too quickly? Have you guys uh, faced those kind of challenges, remote, physical location, things like that, that the industry is currently talking about? Oh yeah. We, when we started hiring, we went fully remote and reason being is we're, we're just trying to hire the best engineers wherever we can. And so there's five of us now, including me and my co-founder, Alex, and we've been, we've stayed pretty small. And I think at the next stage, we'll also continue to stay small. I think I've seen some incredible products be built with small teams. And I think we can get a lot done so long as we're hiring high caliber people. Uh, remote is incredibly challenging. Obviously, you just, I think by 
us being remote from the beginning, it's made it a little bit easier though, because we've kind of developed habits and strategies to yeah. deal with it versus a company that was in person from the start and then you go remote and it's very hard to kind of reconcile all your processes and, and the way that you work. So for us, we obviously, we meet every day if we can. We're all on different time zones, which makes it even more complicated, but we meet at least once every day, lots of asynchronous chats going on. And then we do try to meet up uh, once in person, which has been incredibly helpful. We met up last year, all like just a, a company outing and that chance to just be together, get to know each other in person, like humanize each other uh, made a big difference. And in terms of AI changing the industry, obviously you have a first mm -hmm. sort of first in line perspective on that. How do you see AI evolving? How do you see e-commerce being affected from it? Do you think that the more advanced AI gets, mm -hmm. the better the, or the more users have the desire to search, to buy things, or do you think that things get automated so much that maybe mm -hmm. they become sort of these users where they just buy an automated list of items and then necessarily they don't care as much as they used to about spontaneous buying? How do you think mm -hmm. that affects mm -hmm. the industry? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to figure out where it goes too. I think, well, one, one thing I will say about AI, I, I think there's a lot of really smart researchers out there that like Jan LeCun, who is chief scientist of, of Meta's AI department, the current way that these AI models like LLMs are being created will not get us to where, where they want to go. Like they're not going to get us to this sort of AGI. It could be a piece of it. It could certainly be something that uh, plays a role, but you have to give it either like a sensory or a logical side to rely on, which is why we took that approach, why we built the knowledge graph and paired it with the LLM. Do I know that our approach is going to get us to AGI? No, but I do know that something different is needed. And so in terms of where AI is going, I think there's a kind of depreciating returns with the way that the, the models are, are currently built. And then also you have this data problem. So it's at least for the e-commerce world, until you clean up the data, you're not going to get a better e-commerce search. So that, that's what we're doing behind the scenes at Deft. But in terms of where, where the where the e-commerce industry is going. So I definitely think to your point about uh, like personalized LLMs or personalized recommendations, I, I think that's, that's accurate. I think that over time, as you can kind of personalize them, they can assist you with your shopping journey and they'll know your buying habits a lot better than anything else. So imagine we've already seen what Copilot has done for, mm -hmm. for coding. Imagine that same sort of thing for the e-commerce world where you're able to just ask some questions, get some answers, make decisions on products a lot quicker. But the kind of the counterpoint is that trustworthiness is decreasing. These AI models, there's tons of auto-generated content that's being created all the time. And is it valid or is it just completely yeah. hallucinated? And so it's going to put the burden on the user to try to figure out the trustworthiness of products. So I think something interesting in the e-commerce space is what pops out of that. Like, how do we verify the trustworthiness of these things? How do we verify that it was actually a human wrote, that wrote this, this information about the product, this review, whatever you're looking at? and then. Outside of AI, a trend that I'm excited about is just AR, VR in general. And mm -hmm. uh, obviously it's not there yet, but I mean, given five to 10 years, the ability to try something before buying it directly in your home would make e-commerce dramatically more accessible. In the furniture and home decor space, you wouldn't have to go to measure the dimensions or see it in person. I mean, same for clothes, just being able to try them on is, is amazing. And it could, it could mean a huge change to returns, like return policies and, and all sorts of, there'd be all sorts of changes in e-commerce. So I'm, I'm excited about the future. I'm excited about where AI VR is kind of taking us and I'm excited to be building in the space. As a technology fan and just enthusiast, I have to ask this question, even though I'm sure <laughs> that's not in your priority list. Obviously e-commerce is a main focus for you, but considering the fact that once a search engine or a company gets good at search engine capabilities for one industry, do you ever see deft sort of maybe not pivoting, but adding more things that could help users look for things and not necessarily buy them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or is that definitely. something that that is, that's kind of been, I think we started with e-commerce because that was the, that's the messiest category right now, mm -hmm. but there's a ton of other search categories that are out there that are also broken. I'm just not maybe quite to the same level as e-commerce. Yeah. So I think that by building this natural language, multimodal search engine, we can apply that to a lot of other search categories. Travel is a good example where natural language is really important or just like general web search. So we are definitely thinking outside of the box in a couple of years. We're very focused on e-commerce right now. It's probably going to stay that way for a while. 
But just like Amazon moved from books to CDs into other categories, yeah. we've been doing a similar thing with our own catalog. And I could see us moving outside of those e-commerce categories in the future because, you know, the web's a messy place and it needs, it needs being able to find things is, is, is really cool. Yeah. And obviously it's very messy and it's becoming even more and more global every day. So in yep. terms of integrating with a global audience, I'm curious in terms of mm. the languages that you can use in your, in your app, maybe even targeting user from, users from other countries. What is your guys' position on that? Are you thinking about that? There's, there's over 2 billion products in the web, tons of them. And there's, there's close to a billion just in the U.S. alone on reputable websites. So there is a large enough for definitely a lot of market to focus on here for the time being. There's also some challenges that you get into with e-commerce. Like if, if we put something on our site, we want to make sure that it's available, that it's in stock, that you can actually buy the thing. We wouldn't want somebody to come to our search engine and find something that's the perfect fit, but you can only buy it in a certain country. So we're not ready to expand into other other countries quite yet, but we we would definitely love to. And that's part of natural language. There's other languages than just English, yeah. which is what we're using now. And I've asked this question to a number of founders because especially with in your case with AI and e-commerce and everything, it could get so hectic. So on a personal side, what do you do as a founder as just as an executive to relax? Hmm. What's like your, how do you balance the work life thing? What's your yeah. routine basically? Not well, definitely work more than, more than your average human being, but to, to relax, lots of reading. And I also do jujitsu in my spare time now. That's kind awesome, of my, yeah. my, my hobby of choice. Yeah, it seems to have sort of integrated into tech suddenly. It has. Yeah. It's really, it's really, yeah, yeah, it's huge now. It's surprising. So yeah, I've been doing it for maybe three or four years now. And it's awesome. before that I was doing competitive weightlifting. And then I decided that I wanted to put more of the, uh, the fitness and, and muscles that I built to use. And so I started doing jujitsu. Yeah, it's, it, it definitely is becoming more famous. It's growing and it's awesome to see. And also to close on this note as a last question, where do you see the company going in five to 10 years? If someone would say what the dream scenario would be, do um, you have a scenario in mind or basically you're just operating on a day-to-day -day or year-to-year -year basis and you're not thinking about it is definitely thinking into the future for sure on a, on, we are just focused on the day to day right now. I think for us, especially over five years from now, we want to be the place that people start their searches for e-commerce. We don't want to just be a, a place that you kind of venture after. We want to be the, the starting point. And so that's, that's our goal over the next five years. We'll do that for e-commerce first, and then we'll move into other categories after that. Well, on this note, Zach, thanks for joining the conversation with us today. I think the audience enjoyed this combo a lot. We've definitely learned a lot about the industry and we can't wait to see where Deft and you go. And we're going to follow, I'm guessing, with all the audience in your future endeavors. So all the successes for you and the company and all the best. I love it. Thanks so much. And thanks for our audience once again. And we'll see you on our next interview.